Hello everyone. My name is Mary Helen Pombo and as a fellow at the Center for Health Policy at Imperial College London, I lead on the Leading Health Systems Network program. And I'm pleased to welcome you to this LHSN webinar on key elements of an antimicrobial stewardship program. To provide some background, the LHSN is a collaborative network of healthcare leaders and organizations working to improve health service delivery. Based here at Imperial College, LHSN works in partnership with the World Innovation Summit for Health. Before diving into our content, I welcome you to interact with others listening to the session and tweet key messages by using our Twitter hashtag for this event, hashtag LHSN webinar, along with other suggested hashtags on the presentation. With that, I'll introduce our speakers who we have the great pleasure of hosting. Rahila Ahmed is the Health Management Program Lead within the Faculty of Medicine here at Imperial College. Her area of work principally focuses on organizational change, health economics, sustainability, and evaluation at the National Institute for Health Research within the Health Protection Research Unit for Healthcare-Associated Infections and Antimicrobial Resistance. She was awarded the prestigious NIHR Fellowship in Knowledge Mobilization, where she leads research to evaluate sustained impact of interventions across the healthcare economy to address antimicrobial resistance. Following 10 years of management experience in the National Health Service England, Rahila completed her doctorate in health management at Imperial's Business School, which preceded a master's in health management from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Now, our co-presenter is Ismita Cherani, who was a senior academic pharmacist also within Imperial's Health Protection Research Unit for Healthcare-Associated Infections and Antimicrobial Resistance. Among various roles, she is also a visiting researcher at Hawklands University Hospital in Norway and Amrita's Institute of Medical Sciences in India, where she is involved in assisting the implementation of their National Antibiotic Stewardship Program. As an investigator in the NIHR Invention for Innovation Award program, Asmita investigates the development and use of a point-of-care personalized clinical decision support tool for antimicrobial prescribing. Asmita brings 10 years of experience as a clinical pharmacist in hospitals, including Cambridge University Hospital. She is a recipient of the RPSGB Gallon Pharmacy Research Award for research into antibiotic dosing and obesity. Asmita completed a master's in pharmacy at the University College London, and a master's of science in infectious diseases at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, as well as a PhD from Imperial College London. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Rahila. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you very much, Mary, and um, welcome all. So it's really great to be able to talk about the work from our research units at Imperial College. And here you can see the overview of the session this morning. I'll be talking through the first two parts of this, and Dr. Sharani will then follow on with some real examples from across the globe. So in terms of where we sit in the in Imperial College London, we have a multifaceted, multidisciplinary research unit, and this work is headed up by Professor Alison Holmes. It's a collaboration across the departments of medicine, engineering and public health and the institute here, looking at this sort of sometimes formidable problem of AMR. But we're looking at this from different disciplines and working collaboration to tackle some of these issues at the national and international level. And today's webinar considers organizational and management contexts as well as the content and implementation processes of antimicrobial stewardship programs. And I'm going to take the liberty of using AMS going forward now as, as an acronym. The focus is mainly on hospital programs, but of course it is important that we extend the focus to all parts of the health economy in primary and social care as well. So when looking at contexts, we look at AMS programs and their relevance and how to implement at the macro level, um, that's the wider context, the health system level and beyond. We look at the organizational or meso level, 
and of course the individual micro level and that includes patients, healthcare professionals and managers and policy makers. So looking at that macro level to start off with, we've been looking at how governance arrangements, structures and processes have been implemented in um, different countries in relation to AMR, but particularly to AMS programs as well. The need for collaborative approaches in governance have been highlighted, of course, at the international level. The science ministers of the G8 and the UK government review on AMR, often referred to as the O'Neill review, have highlighted international collaboration. But we need to know what countries are doing at the national level if we are able to respond to such calls of collaboration. Are we approaching governance in very different ways? So governance approaches can be broadly categorised as centrally driven or devolved. They can be top-down or more network and collaborative approaches. And that's quite sort of a, a dichotomy and sort of a bit basic in the way I've presented it, but it's a start in terms of having a look. A comparative study has looked at England, France and Germany and looking at what sort of frameworks and structures are in place. And we were interested in looking at the frameworks and structures um, at the health system level and then structures which were specific to the prevention of AMR and looking to see whether they were aligned with what the health system at the national level was doing even and how they compared across these three countries. We looked at three specific functions of governance, priority setting, performance monitoring and accountability, again at the health system and specifically for AMR. And we do encourage you to read this analytical piece, which has been published in ARIC. But broadly, we can describe that France and England have centrally set priorities, but they differ quite markedly in that England, over, over the last decade and more, has really tightened controls and increased the top-down element of accountability and monitoring whereas France has moved more towards devolved responsibility for monitoring and accountability to the regional levels. Germany, on the other hand, has a highly devolved health structure and the monitoring and accountability for AMR follows this pattern. However, Germany is now thinking of moving to more centrally driven priority settings for the reasons described above, in that if we are to collaborate, there needs to be some consistency. England and France, although quite similar in many ways, divert in other ways, England introduced penalties for non-performance, i.e. shortfall against target set, whereas France has used penalties to, in terms of failure to report rather than performance. So although on the surface it may look like France and England have both introduced penalties in terms of monitoring and accountability, it's for very different reasons. And this kind of um, detail is important when you're comparing countries even of similar economies. So if we look a little further at England, we know that England has aligned its priorities with the wider health system. There is an increasing amount of information in the public domain um, and you can see here that AMR local indicators sit side by side with a, a whole suite of indicators and these indicators are in the public domain and they are actually available even down to primary care level now so you can see the indicators on antibiotic use um, and other infection control indicators to hospital level of course but also primary care general practice level. But what is this amount of information in the public domain doing? What is it doing in terms of governance, accountability? Has this translated to a more network and collaborative approach to governance? Has it defined roles for the public and patients? So looking at European countries, and this study led by Dr. Enrico Castro Sanchez, who spoke earlier in this series of seminars, shows that this hasn't really happened but we, we can see some signs of this in the Nordic countries. If we look at governance in terms of self-governance at the individual level, then really this is where we want to see things going. 
We know that other groups are also looking at this at the very macro level. We have Stephen Hoffman's group in Canada at York University leading work on governance and international collaboration. So we hope this will complement his work. So moving on to another level of macro analysis, we've also looked at England versus Japan. And again, England is something of an outlier in terms of how structured its um, interventions have been. Mandatory, outcomes-based, punitive, with some incentives. And Japan very much centred around voluntary reporting, non-mandatory measures, and based on persuasive interventions rather than mandatory. And this can be interesting when you're looking at context in terms of cultures and how quality improvement can be measured or brought about. And it's important that when you're making these kind of comparisons, you are looking in depth at cultural context of a nation as well. So I hope that gives you a little bit of flavor of the macro level analysis we've been carrying out. So moving on now to MISO level, the organizational level, we wanted to share today some of the work around innovation adoption and the learning from that, from the work that we've been doing at the research units. If we are to view at AMS programs essentially as process innovations or new models of care, then we can learn how implementation may or may not work from innovation adoption. I'm not going to go through these in much detail, but I am going to throw out the sort of three consistent messages that have been coming from this work. The first is that organizational slack is necessary. Recognizing professional perspectives as powerful sources of influence is important and culture matters more than organizational form. So by organizational slack, we mean that there is room to grow and to innovate and organizational slack takes different forms and you may reflect in your own organizations how this may or may not appear. But here's an example from the work that we've been doing a sort of a fairly crude but still helpful presentation of number of staff in hospitals in the UK versus the number of innovations along the vertical axis in terms of innovations in IPC, infection prevention control, and AMS. And what we notice is the U-shaped curve, uh, which is what you'd actually expect in any other industry, so it's similar in healthcare. What we find, however, is that the smaller hospitals or firms, although are innovating, there is the risk or danger of innovation fatigue. And at the, at sort of the other end of larger hospitals, there is the risk of throwing everything at the problem, which means you're not really sure what has brought about the change. So things to consider. This is probably not a new one for our audience. Professional perspectives differ, and there is often resistance to change and different resistance from different professional groups. But we wanted to share why this might be. And um, Dr. Shirani will go into some, some more details in her cases from across the globe. We found that when it came to organizational decision making, different professionals did use evidence differently. And they were aware of different evidence for AMS programs. So I'm just going to run through a few slides here just to show you what that looked like. So the first one is doctors and how they use evidence in organizational decision making. Awareness is the lighter green and dark green is what they used. And you can see that there is more of a tendency towards certain guidelines and frameworks. But if you can hold that pattern in your head, hopefully, I can see that when we look at nurses, they have a much wider spread in terms of the sources that they're using for making decisions. And the pattern comes back similar to doctors when you look at pharmacists. And you may all reflect, depending on what your professional backgrounds are, why that might be. And we can certainly pick that up in discussion. The third point was culture matters, rather than focusing on organizational design. And again, as Mita will pick up some of this shortly. But I just wanted to highlight that culture matters, but if IPC and AMS programs are invisible in the organizational structure in terms of program implementation. It is not clear which resources are then available, available for these activities. So we do need to pay attention to organizational structure along with this. And you can work through some activities in this um, publication 
ebook publication um, if you are minded to do so. And there are contributions from, from the team at this research unit. Here from that publication is an example of a, a structure, and we might like to reflect on the governance structure that this chart might give rise to. So when we're looking at governance at the international level, we also want to look at governance in terms of priority setting, monitoring, accountability at the organisational level also. So just to, to round up in terms of what does that mean for people that are implementing AMS programmes, if you're an organisational member, so for all organisational members, all professionals have an influence on programme implementation. So what we would say is be mindful of the impact you have. For organisational leaders, creating space and opportunity for debate about evidence and guidelines is important. But what we do sometimes see is wasted resources and energy in reinventing and re-evaluating the evidence. And we'd really say look to the published literature and the national evidence base where possible and creating that organizational slack which is very difficult in that we have constraint health systems but there are innovative ways of doing this and then finding out how your AMS program may integrate with existing priority and structures. So before I hand over to Esmita just wanted to signpost to work that we're going forward with because what we really want to be able to do is look across all of those levels, the individual, the organisational and the wider context macro level. And here we're looking to exploit soft systems approaches in projects at the unit. And we're collaborating here with Professor Rifat Hatun at Harvard and some, some excellent work that's going on with Dr. Reda Lebchir, who is a system dynamics specialist. And with that, I should hand over to Asmita. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rahila. Hi, everyone. In today's webinar, we will be discussing the practical recommendations for the implementation of antimicrobial stewardship across different resource settings, drawing from the findings in the literature and research, and using case studies from different countries, including England, India, Bangladesh, and South Africa. We will also discuss the latest research we are undertaking across different countries to address antibiotic stewardship across the surgical pathway. Aware that I may be speaking to a well-informed audience, rather than dwelling on the problem of antimicrobial resistance, I will try and focus on the research and innovation that addresses how we can tackle it in hospitals. However, it is important to remind ourselves of the key drivers for antimicrobial resistance globally. Antibiotic misuse and overuse in human and animal populations remain two of the most important contributing factors to the emergence of antimicrobial resistance. The talk today will focus on the efforts underway to develop a clearer understanding of how and why antibiotics continue to be misused in human populations and what we can do to optimize their use. This timeline illustrates in blue some of the key stewardship interventions implemented over the last 10 years in one teaching hospital trust in London against national and international policies, guidelines and recommendations in black and red. This timeline illustrates the clutter and noise against which individual interventions aiming to optimize antibiotic use in hospitals need to be evaluated and assessed. Often it is very difficult to attribute meaningful and measurable change to any single intervention implemented in hospitals. In addition, countries are expected to implement action plans and interventions targeting antibiotic prescribing across very different economies. This graph from a study that we recently conducted across five countries um, includes data on the estimated prevalence of healthcare associated infections versus the expenditure on health per capita and the number of hospital beds per thousand population. What is clear from this graph is that the countries with the greatest burden of healthcare associated infections often are the ones with the least resources available to them. And this is an important point to bear in mind when setting expectations of what can be implemented and achieved. To address this disparity, efforts have been made to develop core elements for global antimicrobial stewardship programs that include the low and middle income settings. 
Through a process of literature review, Delphi consensus with 15 experts in the implementation of antimicrobial stewardship across the globe and surveys of hospitals implementing antimicrobial stewardship. Seven core elements and 29 checklist items for global antimicrobial stewardship programs have been identified. The core elements are senior hospital management leadership towards antimicrobial stewardship. This includes having formal hospital management identified to be in charge of antimicrobial stewardship programs and developing standing, um, staffing standards. Accountability and responsibility. This means having formal written strategy guidelines and professional leadership identified. And clinicians other than infectious disease clinicians being involved. Available expertise on infection management, including access to laboratory imaging and access to trained healthcare professionals in infection prevention and control and infectious diseases. Education and practical training for both staff who are involved in antimicrobial stewardship, but also general healthcare professionals working in the organization. And this training has to be regular, not a one-off. Other actions aiming at responsible antimicrobial use, including multidisciplinary stewardship teams available, having an antibiotic formulary, and policies on prescribing of antibiotics. Continuous monitoring and surveillance to monitor the quality of antibiotic use and reporting and feedback, particularly reports on, on consumption and susceptibility testing that is shared with prescribers. These recommendations can provide a template for organizations across different resource settings aiming to implement antimicrobial stewardship. However, it's important to realize that whilst guidelines and recommendations provide a roadmap to how and what needs to be done, they do not always address the complexity that is inherent in healthcare. Different healthcare professionals and teams are often working to different policies, targets, and end goals. It is important, therefore, to understand and accept that there are no universal solutions to the challenges of complex healthcare systems. Greenhealth and colleagues in a recent set of papers in BMC Medicine argue eloquently that rather than try to control for complexity, we need to attend to it. And I would recommend the viewers of this presentation to read the series of articles and to better understand that we need to be able to influence culture and context in healthcare if we are to change behaviors. Culture is defined as the shared knowledge that people use to interpret, experience, and generate behaviors as members of a group. It is the shared norms, values, and assumptions that can help explain healthcare behaviors in the context of which they are observed. Our previous research has highlighted the lack of qualitative research to inform interventions aiming to change antibiotic prescribing behaviors. We identified that few of the published studies provide a theoretical rationale for their interventions. And subsequent to this, we conducted in-depth qualitative studies with individuals who have a role in antimicrobial stewardship in hospitals, namely doctors, nurses, and pharmacists, and described the existence of a set of unwritten rules in relation to antibiotic use in the hospital setting. This includes non-interference with the prescribing decisions of others, acceptance to non-compliance to policy and hierarchy, where prescribing by junior doctors is often dictated by senior members of the team who actually decide what is to be prescribed for individual patients. Further qualitative research has also highlighted that antibiotic decision making follows a Bayesian process where behaviors are not in isolation but an evolving continuum. It is therefore necessary to understand the factors that influence prescribing behaviors and decisions. And it's important to ask, are policy and guidelines sufficient for sustainable behavior change? Are we considering culture and context adequately when developing interventions? Understanding culture and context is highly relevant when trying to understand how and why interventions and policies fail to be implemented as expected. 
we will use a case study from India in the implementation of antimicrobial stewardship programs to try and understand this. Amrita Institute of Medical Sciences in the southern state of Kerala is a not-for-profit charitable private tertiary hospital. And the case study in the next slide is a story of how this hospital was successful in implementing an antimicrobial stewardship program as recounted by the staff in this hospital who had a role in developing the stewardship program. Initially, the sensitivity of the New Delhi metallo beta lactamase outbreak was one of the first obstacles in implementing an antimicrobial stewardship program partly because it led to a reluctance to accept that the superbugs are a problem in India. Eventually, a national guideline was developed. And however, this particular guideline was considered to be unimplementable as it was too generic. Realizing that the bottlenecks at national level were going to be a problem in developing a stewardship program locally, the hospital leadership championed the cause at the state level and developed a state level antibiotic policy. They then realized that they needed to train and educate the prescribers within the state. And so with the support of the Indian Medical Association, they developed a module to train all doctors in the state on the policy that was being developed, but also on antibiotic stewardship. At the hospital level, the administration and leadership established an interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary antimicrobial stewardship committee that consisted of pharmacists, critical care doctors, microbiology specialists. And they also were successful in mobilizing pharmacists, clinical pharmacists, to review the antibiotic prescribing for individual doctors. Of course, this initiative initially faced many barriers and opposition, particularly because it was pharmacists who were reviewing the prescribing of doctors. However, with the administrative support and leadership, there has been a shift over time in culture and there is now an acceptance and integration of the stewardship team within the hospital. Today, this interdisciplinary pharmacist-led initiative is the norm within the hospital. And here in this photograph is the team reviewing patient cases on a daily basis in the office of the medical administrator or the superintendent who championed this cause at the hospital. The stewardship team also made use of frugal innovations to support their stewardship programs, such as developing a specific antibiotic medication chart that is used across the hospital. Having a dedicated medication chart for antibiotics is an example of making a small change to the choice architecture, which can lead to significant improvements in prescribing. In situ simulation testing on a dedicated antibiotic chart that we developed in collaboration with the Behavioral Insights team at the Cabinet Office and the Royal College of Art, um, demonstrated significant improvements in the correct dose entries and prompt reviews of antibiotic durations. So this example of antimicrobial stewardship from a hospital in India demonstrates that addressing the seven core elements is possible. Um, through the senior hospital management leadership, um, through setting up mechanisms for accountability and providing available expertise via the stewardship committee, by educating the prescriber and championing the responsible antimicrobial use through monitoring and surveillance and feedback. The Amrita team was successful in developing an antimicrobial stewardship program that over time has been accepted by all the healthcare professionals in the hospital. It is also important to recognize that nurses have a critical role to play in antimicrobial stewardship. Nurse, nurses are the biggest um, workforce in healthcare and they have a significant role to play in every aspect of stewardship. And um, our colleague, Dr. Castro Sanchez, has covered the role of nurses in stewardship in a WISH seminar last month and he discussed in detail um, the role of nurses within the stewardship programs. The concept of interdisciplinary teamwork within stewardship has also been implemented widely in South Africa. The South African stewardship model recognizes the importance of the role of pharmacists and nurses in stewardship. And the model focusing on the, uh, on the contribution of non-specialist pharmacists across 47 net care hospitals highlighted the opportunities in widening the net of the interventionists within antimicrobial stewardship 
and focusing on five targeted measures related to antibiotic prescribing. The pharmacists were able to identify that one in every 15 prescriptions needed an intervention to optimize antibiotic prescribing. In Bangladesh too, a new initiative of model pharmacies is recognizing the importance of the role of community pharmacists in antimicrobial stewardship. Model pharmacists such as the one operated by Jalak Tarafter, a graduate pharmacist in Kumuduni Hospital, ensures that antibiotics are only dispensed by qualified pharmacists against a valid prescription. Bangladesh also has an example of a successful surveillance um, from the Child Health Research Foundation, led by Professor Samir Saha in Dhaka. The foundation employs locally trained healthcare professionals uh, and healthcare workers to conduct demographic and invasive bacterial disease surveillance aimed to reduce childhood morbidity and mortality. All the data is collected on electronic tablets and all children under the age of five have ID cards issued with all their health data stored on the barcoded cards. Through the surveillance system, they have been able to map the causes and incidence of community-acquired serious infections in young children. And their paper published in Lancet this month highlights the predominance of bacterial causes amongst babies who died. However, it also indicates that appropriate prevention measures and management could substantially affect neonatal mortality. Technologies provide many opportunities for effective surveillance. In low and middle income countries, many people live in rural areas off any conventional map and do not have addresses. Um, and a new app that has been implemented across South Africa called What Three Words is, is truly innovative in the way it is trying to solve this problem. Um, this app has divided the entire surface of the world into grids and each grid has a unique three word address. This means that ambulances can now find women in labor, even in areas with no conventional addresses. Um, the technology has also been used in disaster zones and has potential for vaccination coverage and surveillance in antimicrobial resistance. Coming back to our research in antimicrobial stewardship, we are currently investigating how we can optimize antibiotic use in surgical pathways. We conducted a study on the implementation of antimicrobial stewardship across India, Burkina Faso, France, England, and Norway, interviewing stakeholders in antimicrobial stewardship across 49 hospitals in these countries. One of the key findings across all these countries was that the surgical specialty were found to be most difficult to engage with in antimicrobial stewardship. In a more in-depth ethnographic study across one hospital in London, investigating antibiotic use in surgical and medical teams, we identified that antibiotic management is peripheral to the role of surgeons. It is not prioritized and is commonly delegated to other healthcare professionals. Additionally, effective antibiotic management is frustrated by diffusion of responsibility. And the potential solution to improve this could be in assigning explicit responsibility to clinicians to address medical care, working within or with the surgical teams. Mapping the relationship between surgery and infection, we identified many variables that should be considered as part of antibiotic decision making. Antibiotic decision making in surgery should not and is not only about surgical site infection prevention or antibiotic prophylaxis. Our ongoing research and experience at our organization has identified that surgical patients receive more antibiotics for longer periods of time. There is a lower compliance with prescribing policies in surgery versus medicine. Um, and in one carbapenemase producing enterobacteriaceae outbreak alone, the cost to the organization was over one million pounds and led to the emergence of colistin resistance. Furthermore, the risk of overdiagnosis of other healthcare associated infections such as, such as um, hospital acquired pneumonias is higher in surgical patients. In low and middle income countries, rapidly increasing multidrug resistant gram negative pathogens threaten healthcare delivery. Colistin resistance is particularly an emerging problem that um, is faced in healthcare settings in low and middle income countries. 
um, MRSA infections in African hospitals is an established threat, particularly among surgical patients. And in a large cohort study of 25 countries across 247 hospitals in Africa, surgical patients were twice as likely to die after surgery compared to global rates. And infection was the most common complication. In addition, Suboptimal antibiotic prophylaxis and high surgical site infections require surgical, further surgical um, interventions, prolonging hospital stay and mortality. There are therefore opportunities for interventions across the surgical pathway. In the perioperative stage, there is a lack of clarity on responsibility for choice, timing and dose of prophylaxis. In the postoperative phase, there are gaps in the diagnosis of healthcare associated infections and lack of access to antibiotics. And in the follow up care, there are inconsistencies in surveillance of antibiotics. Through an Economic and Social Science Research Council funded program of work, we are currently addressing the key drivers of antimicrobial resistance by developing context relevant preventative measures to reduce the risk of infection and optimize the use of antibiotics, coupled with tailored implementation strategies along the entire surgical pathway. The ASPIRE study spans five countries and is an interdisciplinary in approach with expertise in social science, implementation science, surgery, anesthesia, and infectious diseases. We are currently in India collecting qualitative and quantitative data as part of the study, and our next study site is in South Africa, where we have begun recruitment. There are five interconnected work streams that will investigate the drivers for antibiotic use and infection prevention in surgical pathway at the macro and meso level, leading to the co-design implementation of contextually fit interventions and their evaluation using both qualitative and quantitative methods. Mapping the surgical pathway together with all its actors and actions relevant to antibiotic use and infection prevention is crucial, um, particularly because it is important to recognize that all the healthcare professionals have a role in delivering patient care in the surgical pathway. This includes nurses, pharmacists, operating room staff, including technicians. In many resource settings, um, where because of financial restrictions or resource limitations, um, staff capacity isn't to its full, the wider healthcare workforce is crucial in the delivery of effective healthcare, as illustrated in this photo of a trained and skilled technician performing a hernia repair operation in Mozambique. RESRC funded research across South Africa, India and Rwanda and the UK is an example of research that leads to capacity building and strengthening in low and middle income countries through training a new generation of healthcare leaders in low and middle income countries. Um, we are leading in context aware and challenge read research that includes training of healthcare professionals through one to one training, e learning workshops. Um, and we are investigating the surgical pathways in low and middle income countries, um, particularly ensuring that country level healthcare needs are met. Um, there is strong support and mentorship structure to ensure that um, we share the knowledge and experience and there is ownership and flexibility in the long-term planning of, of the interventions and the programs that we um, implement. And we have a very strong um, track record and experience in establishing validated governance structures to make sure that our work is sustainable in the long term. So in summary, comparing health system governance arrangements with governance, accountability, and roles specific to antimicrobial resistance and infection prevention and control can help identify future directions for national coordination. As antimicrobial stewardship is essentially a process of innovation or new model of care, applying the learning from innovation adoption may be helpful for sustained uptake at the organizational level. Developing effective antimicrobial stewardship programs requires strong leadership and operational support. 
There needs to be an interdisciplinary approach that recognizes the critical role of pharmacists and nurses. Measurement and implementation is a social process that needs to take into account the context and complexity of healthcare systems. And there is a role for frugal innovations, whether they are in choice architecture, in surveillance, or in workforce development, to bring about significant improvements in antimicrobial stewardship programs. And the surgical pathway remains an area where there are opportunities for optimizing antibiotic use. On behalf of myself and Dr. Ahmed, I'd like to thank you all for listening to us and would be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Ismita and Rahila, for your presentation. You've left us with some timely key messages, especially as the LHSN report to be released at WISH this November in Doha focuses precisely on essential elements and components for hospital-based antimicrobial stewardship programs. For members of the audience who may not be aware, the research towards the development of the stewardship program checklist that Ismita referred to earlier in the presentation was partially funded by WISH. This upcoming LHSN report presents the results of the checklist pilot test, which sought to assess the global applicability of this core set of elements that Ismita was a part of defining. And this was done by involving healthcare providers from our network, and they represent a variety of antimicrobial stewardship programs from around the world. You'll find the results of this pilot test, along with other insights in this report, on the LHSN webpage after its launch on the 15th of November in 2018. So do stay tuned to keep up with announcements on that via social media and the LHSN newsletter, which you can sign up for on the webpage. Referring back again to your presentation, Ismita and Rahila, one interesting point that stood out was the message regarding the configuration of an AMS program and how its form is important. However, culture within antimicrobial stewardship program committees and teams is the fundamental key to meeting AMS program objectives. So as we continue to explore more aspects of antimicrobial stewardship programming on this uh, webinar series, it seems to be something um, that we should all be mindful about moving forward. Now let's jump into our question and answer session. We welcome questions, comments, and your reflections along with your name and affiliation if possible. To start, we've received the following question. In your presentation, Rahila, you mentioned the importance of having organizational leaders creating space and opportunity for debate about evidence and guidelines, though in a way that does not necessarily reinvent or reevaluate the evidence. To the community of international healthcare leaders at LHSN, what specific debates would you recommend having? So debates are healthy, particularly when you're talking about evidence, because if you don't have the debates, they can then manifest later and cause non-adoption of interventions. I think, first of all, in terms of knowledge mobilization, we need to be aware of what the evidence is and ensuring that we're up to date. If there are discrepancies within guidelines or contradictions with what's happening on the ground, then it's everybody's responsibility to flag that at organizational level, have that debate and see how to accommodate those discrepancies. There's also the debate about contextual fit, and that's really for, as the questioner says, the, 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 um, the organizational leaders to look at the integration with other activities. So, yeah, debates are healthy. It's just a reinvention and reevaluation when it's actually just a, a waste of resource when there is a good evidence space. Thank you for that, Rahila. Our next question here is, how do you deal with self-medication, including antibiotic self-prescription in lower to middle income countries in connection with antimicrobial stewardship? So there are many interventions that have been implemented at the country level as part of World Antibiotic Awareness Week. And you can find resources and examples on the WHO website. These include social media and other campaigns. A particular national campaign in the UK and wider now actually is the Antibiotic Guardian campaign where professionals, non-professionals, public can sign up and pledge to, to protect antibiotics through various actions. In low 
and middle income countries, um, I think we're yet to exploit the use of community health workers in promoting these messages. As an example, in Pakistan, lady health workers will impart advice on vaccinations, and maternal health, etc., but their training does not include advice on risks of self-medication, particularly for antibiotics. There is the route of regulation, of course, um, in terms of what can be sold, but that carries risks in terms of promoting further unregulated sales and further self-medication. And you saw the example in the talk um, from Bangladesh where pharmacies are trying to stop the um, sales of fake drugs. And we will see how that works. One, of ad one advice in consultations, of course, using persuasive methods, but often people who self-medicate are not visiting physicians. Ultimately, going upstream and education in schools and communities is a promising avenue. Self-medication is not just a problem of LMIX, uh, unfortunately, as online purchasing is an issue in high- and middle-income settings, so um, all actions are um, important in, in all settings. Excellent. Thank you, Rahilo, for imparting your insight on that last question there. Now, to wrap up our session, we always invite our speakers to leave us with any parting messages to our audience prior to closing the session. So in terms of take-home messages, I would say the first is about carrying out that multi-level analysis, looking at what's happening at the macro level, but also, secondly, to make those considerations at the start and planning of a program intervention wherever possible. So particularly pertinent for those thinking about new interventions and planning new interventions, building in that those considerations. Thank you, Rahila. Unfortunately, Ismita is not able to provide an answer due to technical difficulties. Nevertheless, we're very grateful, Rahila and Ismita, for your presentations. Thank you again for that. A warm thanks goes to our audience for joining today. Recordings of this webinar will be available on our website at www.leadinghealthsystemsnetwork.org. As a reminder, LHSN is on social media, so please feel free to follow us on LinkedIn, Twitter, and YouTube, where you can access recordings and new webinar announcements. Prior to ending our webinar session, I'll leave you with an invitation to attend our next webinar on the 18th of September. Dr. Gao, Dr. Chen, and Dr. Heider from Farah, Merit International, and Pfizer will provide a regionally focused webinar on adapting the U.S. Antimicrobial Stewardship Program guidelines to build an economic evaluation framework for Chinese hospitals. To receive reminders about upcoming webinars, be sure to also sign up for the LHSN newsletter or register for individual webinars of your interest online. With that, we'll close our session and we wish you a lovely day and hope that you'll join us again on the 18th of September for our next event.